Over the last three weeks, we've met all 24 finalists in the Ernst & Young Entrepreneur of the Year competition. Decision time is looming for our judges. But first, we've come here to California, where they face their final challenge to unlock the secrets of the Silicon Valley success. All over the country, a quiet revolution is mobilizing, and it's changing the face of Ireland. In the front line are the entrepreneurs, courageous men and women who imagine a future and then make it happen. Theirs is a vision that sees opportunity, where others see only adversity. Theirs is a mindset filled with ideas and optimism. And theirs is a voice determined to fight for our prosperity. This is a community united in a cause. This is the Ernst & Young Entrepreneur of the Year. There can only be one winner of this year's Ernst & Young Entrepreneur of the Year competition. All will be revealed at the final this Thursday. But first, they've gathered in Dublin Airport for one of the largest unofficial trade missions to leave our shores as 115 businessmen and women, including the finalists, judges and the alumni, prepare to depart to the epicentre of entrepreneurship. In the past, the Industrial Revolution shaped the world we live in. Today, the innovations of technology companies are the major engines of the global economy and most of them started within a 30-mile radius of each other in a place known as Silicon Valley, situated south of San Francisco. And so it's the perfect destination for this year's nominees and it's the perfect opportunity for our judges to make one last assessment of our finalists. Well, Silicon Valley is the holy grail of entrepreneurship and innovation. What we're trying to do is to get our 24 finalists this year to really embrace the opportunities in San Francisco and in Silicon Valley, to learn from the best educators in the world, to embrace the best and the most innovative technology, and to try and really bring that home, bring that home into their businesses, grow their businesses, and grow jobs. What about the judging process? I mean, is it underway while we're here this week? Yeah, very much so. All of our judges are here, and it's a huge commitment. But really what they're doing is they're interacting with the entrepreneurs. They're seeing how do our Irish entrepreneurs react and act here in Silicon Valley. And they also try and get to know them and to try and decide who's going to be our Entrepreneur of the Year for 2012. This pocket of Northern California has created an entrepreneurial ecosystem that the rest of the world is trying to emulate. It boasts brains and innovation which in turn attracts investment as venture capitalists seek out their fortunes in the next Google or Facebook. And there's no shortage of entrepreneurs queuing up to pitch for their dollars. One way to meet some venture capitalists is to go before the Koretsu Forum, a real-life dragon's den and two of our finalists have bravely volunteered to test their gift of the gab. Preparing his pitching technique is Paul Kenny, who runs Kabone.com, an online coupon business for the Middle East market. How are you feeling about it all this morning? Quite excited, full of sugar. Tell me about the sugar. Uh, basically, it gives me a bit of impetus to actually speak quite fast and get my message across. Jelly sweets? Yes. <laughs> So tell us then exactly what's going to happen. Uh, there's a two minute pitch, then there's a four minute Q&A from the panel, and then there's a four minute Q&A from the audience. I think there's about over 100 people in the audience today. So it's gonna to be quite exciting. And what do you hope will happen from all of this? I get the money, that's nothing the, else. That, that's the, yeah. the mission. Yeah. The Koretsu Forum is the largest community of angel investors in the world. You get 10 minutes before the panel, and if they're impressed, they'll invest. So do you and your colleagues make a decision today based on what you hear in such a short period of time as to whether you're going to pursue a project or not? Absolutely. It's that quick? Yes. So what happens? Do you just believe in the person or the project or...? Well, we look at the jockey. Uh, that, that, that CEO is very critically important. And one thing about our DNA in Silicon Valley, we like to see if in fact they failed. Here, failure is good if they have failed, but if they learn from their mistakes. We brought together a team of leaders in computer science, medical science, that will provide value for the insurance companies of about five to six X of the additional cost. Yeah, I love your passion and your, and your articulation, but I don't know what you do. Do you know what he does? No, okay, you got 10 seconds to tell you exactly what you do. You know, pitching 
is very critically important because if they can't pitch for capital, they can't pitch for customers. And I see it all the time. It says, gee, a company, yeah, it's important to pitch for capital, but if they can't, they can't garner the capital from us, then how are they going to then go to Google and, and do business with Google or Facebook or any of our great companies here in North America? The first of our nominees up for the challenge is Matthew Brown of Connect Telecom. What we do and how we do it has been proven to work and we've and proven in the fact that we've been able to double our turnover year on year for the last four years. It's actually a real challenge to distill everything down into a couple of minutes to sort of really uh, get that pitch right about your company. That's a, that's a real challenge. And but also it's very good to actually have a little bit of confidence in, in your business. You know, it's, it's great to, to get some positive feedback. So whenever you actually think about how you're doing it, how you're going to present it, it helps you see what, what is good about what you do. Now it's Paul's turn. I founded a company in August 2010 named Cabone.com. Cabone is actually one of the largest e-commerce companies in the Middle East and North Africa today. It's grown 30% month on month since inception. We do over 100,000 transactions a month right now. How are you going to expand globally? Tell us a little bit about your revenue, income, you know, great concept. Sounds like you got market traction. Do you visualize, do you see any issues with internet access or among the lower, the large lower classes, a lack of disposable income? Yeah, the Middle East would have much more money than the US. Uh, disposable income is significantly higher. GDP would be much higher per capita in many of the countries we operate in. It was really like a roller coaster. I don't remember much. <laughs> it certainly was, but you handled yeah. it very well. I was so nervous starting off, but quite excited. I think I got a good vote there. I'm not sure what the final number was. It was you got the maximum. It was okay. five from everybody. Excellent, yeah. Um, to hook up with these guys it must be a great opportunity. Yeah, I think the, their network is awesome. I think it'll add a lot of value to Cabone and potentially we can do some business together. Well, you're already down the road with the VCs, so go ahead and get their terms, mm -hmm. and then come back to us and we'll beat them. The laid-back Californian culture doesn't stop this area from attracting over one-third of all U.S. venture capital. And the investors come in all shapes and sizes. I'm here in Alamo. It's a small town just outside San Francisco. And the band playing in the park behind me have been entertaining families for the last couple of hours. Now, they're not quite you two, but they're not as far away from the Irish supergroup as you might think. A venture capitalist by day and a musician by night, Roger McNamee has been successfully investing in technology since the 80s. In 2004, he formed Elevation Partners with our very own Bono, who contacted Roger to discuss investment opportunities. He calls me on my cell phone and goes, Roger, it's Bono. And I should have said, Bono who, right? It would have been perfect. I mean, nobody's ever said that to him, right? <laughs> and I'm thinking, but I missed it. I missed the chance. And the hilarious thing, and I'm so embarrassed to admit this, I couldn't have named a U2 song. Oh, you're not a fan. Well, no, it was, I, I am now. I'm a huge fan now. But keep in mind, I am, I'm a few years older than Bono. But he said one of the smartest things I've ever heard anybody say about technology. If you want to be successful as a musician or any other creative person, you want to make a product that shows off the latest hardware that people have. And the notion that what he was doing was at the mercy of that was so insightful that I just went, oh my gosh, you're really interesting. In 2009, Elevation Partners bought shares in Facebook. And when the company floated on the stock exchange earlier this year, they cashed in some of their chips. Although the share price has fallen dramatically since then, Roger had already banked Elevation a huge profit. I want to talk to you about the Facebook IPO, yeah. but your involvement with Facebook goes quite a way back because you knew Mark Zuckerberg early on. I was, I, was, I was introduced by Mark uh, when he was 22 years old, so now six years ago. He comes into my office and said, look, I've been doing this nearly 30 years, and you have created something here that if you play your cards right is going to be the biggest thing for this decade. Okay? But I promise you this, someone and it'll probably be Microsoft or Yahoo will offer a billion dollars to buy you sometime in the next few months. They may have already done it. Your board will tell you to do it, your team will tell you to do it, and your employees will tell you to do it, and your parents will tell you to do it. And I said, you need to think about whether this is the one for you or not, because if it is, you've got to tell them no. I went, well, what do you want? He said, I don't want to sell it. And I said, well, then we're done. So anyway, I was so lucky that he trusted me. In Ireland, I can't tell you how many headlines I read speculating as to how much Bono might have made out of the deal. I'm not going to ask you what that figure is, but Elevation did well, would you say? Were you happy with your, your well, no, investment? No, no. It was a fantastic investment. Facebook has worked out really, really well. You take care, guys.
The finalists are about to experience firsthand the sacred ground of the social network as they get a private tour of Facebook HQ. This for me would be, it'd be very hard to top this. I was saying last night, it's like, uh, it was like Christmas Eve last night for me. <laughs> Being in Facebook's massively inspiring. I think everybody's just walked out with their, their minds blown. I mean, just to see the, the culture, I think, is the one thing that just jumps out at you. It's really refreshing and positive and, and upbeat. It feels like they're trying to change the world here. It's a, one of the few places where you've walked in and, and they actually, they believe that rightly or wrongly. It's a great thing for us personally because we actually work a lot with Facebook back in Ireland so it's great to see like this is really the engine room of, of where it all happens and, and, and the fact that they control the sort of outflow of data for 900 million people out of these buildings, I mean it's just a, a fantastically exciting thing to see. Coming up in part two, we visit some of the first industries to flourish in the region and meet an Irishman who has figured out a few of the valley's secrets. I think the environment here is one of Failure is almost success. and colour of the Pride Parade. It's just one of the many attractions that San Francisco has to offer. But it's a leafy suburb just south of the city that really steals all the headlines. The suburbs surrounding Stanford University are where much of the tech revolution began as engineering students carved out companies literally in their own backyards. It's little more than a small garden shed, but it was here that two Stanford students, Bill Hewlett and Dave Packard, started their first company in 1939. Their trailblazing innovation planted a seed that allowed this entrepreneurial region to flourish. The Irish entrepreneurs had the pleasure of listening to world-renowned Stanford professor Charles O'Reilly, who was mindful of the nurturing role his predecessors in the university played. The history of Silicon Valley is really intertwined with the history of, of Stanford. Stanford had, many years ago, 50 years ago, had a great engineering department. They trained engineers who went off to found companies like Varian and Hewlett Packard. If you look at Silicon Valley, what you see is a confluence of the people who want to set up companies, who have the skills, the universities that provide much of the technology, and the venture capital that provide the resources. I think that's what, what's made this a very special place. As well as looking for life on Mars, the NASA Ames Research Center has played a pivotal role in developing the culture of innovation that exists in the Valley today. One man who remembers the very early days is Jack Boyd, who is still working here after 65 years of service. In 1939 is when this center was established. The Army was here. There wasn't much around us, but there was good flying weather for research aircraft. There was cheap power for the big wind tunnels we were going to build, and there were outstanding academic universities already here. Many of the people that they used came from Stanford, for example. And I think the entrepreneur characteristic, the ability and willing to take risks, kind of grows out of an academic background. There were very few companies here at the time. They came later. The Lockheed's came later, the Hewlett Packard's came later. But being in a place where the academic world was close by helped us tremendously, I think. 
It's not all work and no play as our finalists prepare for a 14 kilometer leisurely cycle and, naturally, amongst a group of entrepreneurs, competition is heating up already. It's been a grueling three days. You know, we've got the peloton here behind us. A few of the lads have been wearing the yellow jersey for the last few days, so I'm going for it today. I think the, the hills are going to take it. There's a few guys here who reckon they've done the Tour de France a couple of times, you know. So uh, I just go in their slipstream. They're kind of teaching me how to, how to, how to follow in their slipstream. You know yourself, Kuna Maramin. We'll get there eventually. It's been inspirational. You know, crossing San Francisco, the Golden Gate Bridge, you know, on bikes and, and surrounded by uh, a huge amount of inspirational entrepreneurs over the last four days has been very special. Like, you know, mm -hmm. It's phenomenal. Well, to tell the truth, when we came first, we were kind of thinking, what are we doing here? This is just a world apart from, from our experiences at home. Um, but it's just, it's world class. It puts you on another plane, gets you thinking on a different level. And with the mentality out here, you know, never say never, anything is possible. It's a fantastic experience. When you're here, are you judging while you're here? Right up to now, we're looking at business plans and figures and stuff on paper. This is the first time you get an opportunity to actually sit down and talk to them and say, who's behind those figures? What kind of a person is this person or are those people? And you get a greater sense of really what motivates them, what drives them. Entrepreneurship now is really be becoming quite an important part of Irish society. Years ago, if you described yourself as an entrepreneur, you were a bit of a chancer. You know, now it's it's... It is, and it is a, a, an honourable thing to employ people, to strive to start companies and to build them. Just as here in California, people don't feel that they're stretching it by calling themselves entrepreneurs. It's a normal term here. And I think in, in the coming years in Ireland, it, it will be very much mainstream. So the future looks bright for Irish business, but the Irish entrepreneurial spirit has been evident here for centuries, and San Francisco is no exception. I caught up with historian Tony Booker in the famous Haight-Ashbury district. This is known, obviously, the world round as the home of the counterculture and the you know, summer of love took place from 1964, uh, 67. But previous to that, it was a very, uh, you know, it was a thriving working class neighborhood with a lot of Irish folks. Some of the earliest pioneers to these parts were the Irish, who arrived on famine ships and crossed the new frontiers in wagons to seek their fortune in the new world. There were uh, some very enterprising people like Jasper O'Farrell, John L. Sullivan. Sullivan was a, not only a successful entrepreneur, but a very good person. And uh, as remembered to this day as someone who achieved great wealth in the gold rush, established the uh, Hibernia Bank, uh, and other businesses. I was a great owner of property in the city. The Irish who made it here in the uh, early 1800s, mid 1800s, their edifices live to this day. You have the Flood Mansion, the Flood Building downtown, uh, the Fairmont Hotel. So these are people who are really kind of integral part of the, the heritage of the city. So can we assume then that Irish entrepreneurs are welcome in San Francisco today too? Oh, I think that's a very safe assumption, absolutely. <laughs> When we started the CEO retreat, really our thinking was to get the 24 finalists together and allow them to meet each other and see that they all shared similar issues. And it's really developed from there. Now that there are so many alumni who come, they see the strength of that network and they see very immediate business opportunities. And perhaps more than that, they form real relationships of trust with people that really help them to share issues and, and have real benefit for their business. One Irishman who is capitalising on the Irish diaspora is previous Ernst & Young Entrepreneur of the Year winner Terry Clune. His latest venture, Connect Ireland, hopes to draw on Irish people's relationships abroad to attract business back home. What we're looking for simply is, if you know a company that could be expanding to Europe, let us know about the company and our team will take it from there. We'll explain to the company why they should locate that business in Ireland. And if they do, the guy who connected us receives a reward for themselves at their preferred charity, up to a max of 150,000 euro. There's so many people out there who have got connections that aren't being used. The biggest employer in the northwest of Ireland for years is MBNA. MBNA is going through difficulties now, but MBNA set up in Carrick and Shannon, the wettest part of Ireland. And it didn't set up, up there because the rain, it set up there because the CEO of the bank at the time, three of his grandparents were from Carrick and Shannon. 
and his grandmother asked him to set up the business, not in Dublin, where they were looking to set it up, but instead to set it up in Carrick and do something for the people of Carrick and Shannon. What it simply is do, doing is asking people to use their connections. There are only two countries in Europe that speak English natively, Ireland and England, and Ireland is the only one in the Eurozone. Google have chosen Ireland for their cloud computing centre because of our weather. Not every Irish person loves the weather, but the weather is perfect for cloud computing because it doesn't get too hot, it doesn't get too cold in Ireland. Irish people have a tremendous work ethic. Very, very smart, highly educated. So we have a lot of advantages that when you step them out, they can, Ireland makes a lot of sense for a huge amount of companies. The strength of Connect Ireland is built on the Irish experience abroad. Like many Irish in the past, Silicon Valley-based entrepreneur Conrad Burke made his fortune in the States, but feels Ireland has a lot to gain from the American model of success. So you arrived here in 1989, Conrad. Yes. Quite some time ago. What was, what was Ireland, the Ireland life that you were leaving behind at that time? That's a great question. You know, I sometimes look back at that year. It was when I graduated, I left Ireland. There wasn't really much going on, but it seemed like five minutes after I departed the country, the Celtic Tiger took off. So much to my disappointment, I felt I missed out on the great wave of prosperity that hit Ireland. I think being Irish anywhere in the world, and I lived in a number of countries, but particularly here in the United States, there is a very strong closeness between Americans and our Irish people, and I certainly am guilty of taking advantage of that, maybe you could say, in some ways. And I think the Irish have a wonderful way to tell stories, and we all know what that means, and I think there's a truth to that, where we can tell stories, tell about ourselves, tell about our lives, and tell about our company, our business, quite well, maybe more so than other nations, and I think that's something that is very useful to open doors to get to where you need to get to in business. Some of the greatest companies, Cisco, Apple, Facebook, Google, they're, they all started in somebody's basement or garage or in their in, in, in a shed and, and those are the things that inspire people to keep doing that and I think the environment here also is one of failure is almost success. I know that sounds very strange to say that but uh, you are rewarded for trying and you learn a lot from that, hopefully you learn a lot from that and you, sign, you find a lot of people that continue to keep doing those. Because you had your own experience of that because your first ventures weren't successful. And That's right. My first company I went into, we lost $135 million and I think the, 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 the statement of, of failure is success and you're allowed that second chance is so true when I give you the example of after having lost $135 million, our largest shareholder who lost $35 million of that uh, deal employed me the next day as one of their partners. So I think there's so many uh, great uh, optimisms and, uh, and, and capabilities here in the U.S. that perhaps are not really in other parts of the world. And I'm hoping, and I do see elements of that in, in Ireland, and I'm hoping that we can emulate some of that back home. So we're at the end of yeah. a long and busy week, Frank. What do you think the nominees have learned? What can they take away from this? Well, I think each of the finalists have had very, very different experiences. They've all embraced an awful lot of the opportunities that Silicon Valley has to offer. From the best educators in the world, from interacting with the CEOs of the biggest companies in the world, and really trying to embrace how do they bring those experiences back into their businesses? How do they look at markets differently? How do they grow their businesses based on technology? But most important, we really want to ensure that the entrepreneurs bring back the opportunities, put it into their businesses and grow and generate jobs. I am just so excited about the difference that this is going to make in my business. I'm not just saying that for you guys, this is very significant what we're going to do. I've certainly been challenged to rethink uh, and I think that's a big thing for me is that I have to, I have to kind of rethink the way uh, I'm managing, I have to rethink the way I'm thinking about business and I have to rethink the way I'm looking at opportunities. It's inspirational. I got as much stimulation in one week as I would have in one or two years going to various conferences at home. So that's how important it was. One last question for you, Frank. Yeah. Do you have a winner's name in your mind? <laughs> Actually, I have the name of the winner in my back pocket. But we're going to have to wait till our award show to find out who is our Entrepreneur of the Year for 2012. And so we've come to the end of our week here in California. Our entrepreneurs have been encouraged and inspired by their experiences. Now all that remains is to reveal the overall winner. So tune into our awards ceremony this Thursday night on RTE1, where from our group of 24 finalists, we discover the Ernst & Young Entrepreneur of the Year for 2012.